Okay, well, thank you uh, for that introduction. It's a, a huge pleasure to be here. Um, should, I, should I sit or stand? What's the format here usually like? Um, All right, well, let me see if I can sit down and still be commanding here. So um, today's talk is about work that I've done over the past year in India. And um, Indian civilization is famous for its great epic stories, like the Ramayana. Um, and so this talk is going to be a little bit of an epic. Uh, it's going to have uh, action and adventure, uh, twists and turns, a little bit of ambiguity. Um, and like any good epic, there'll be uh, important lessons for computer science. Um, this is based on joint work um, with uh, a large number of co-authors, including my grad students at Michigan and um, uh, Rob Honkreip from the Netherlands and Harry Prasad from India, who is going to be a major character in this story. Um, Harry, I'll introduce very briefly now. Um, he is an engineer and entrepreneur based in Hyderabad. Um, he is not an academic but he became deeply involved in India's electronic voting uh, questions um, after um, he was approached by uh, uh, certain activists and uh, uh, nonprofits in India who had concerns about India's voting systems and asked to look into them. And this became uh, a major adventure for Harry and a big chapter in his life. Um, and our remaining co-authors uh, work at Harry's company in Hyderabad, where they do uh, uh, R&D. <clears throat> so India's electronic voting system, let me introduce this to you. Um, India is the world's largest democracy. Uh, in the last parliamentary election, there were almost 800 million votes cast. Um, so uh, the scale of the challenges that their officials face in implementing an election system is just immense. Um, those officials are the Election Commission of India, uh, the highest election authority in the country. They're a constitutional body, an independent branch of the government. Um, you, you might think uh, like our Supreme Court is an independent branch. The Election Commission there is an independent branch. And while the elections are going on, the ECI actually has the authority to suspend or take control of any other government enterprise uh, if they feel it's necessary or otherwise obstructing to the election. Um, ECI introduced electronic voting uh, in India over a period of almost 30 years. Um, they first developed uh, uh, they first began the development of electronic voting machines, uh, or EVMs, as they're always referred to in India, um, uh, in uh, 1980. And uh, the uh, designs were developed by a pair of Indian government-owned companies, uh, ECIL and BEL, um, during this time. So the initial prototypes were developed uh, in the 80s, uh, the designs were improved and gradually introduced in certain places um, uh, with big changes in 89 and 2006. Um, but the machines were used nationwide for the first time in 2004. Um, and today in uh, state and national elections, basically uh, any major election in India, uh, it's conducted entirely using electronic voting. So, these machines are paperless electronic voting machines. And paperless electronic voting has been studied very widely in the US and Europe. There have been a long series of studies um, where researchers somehow, one way or another, got access to voting machines that were actually being used in a country's elections and uh, took them apart to see just whether they were uh, tamper resistant or not. And in the US and Europe, um, Every single one of these studies has found really significant security flaws. So we think it's, it's fairly well established that paperless electronic voting, as it is being practiced today in the US and Europe, um, is extremely vulnerable to fraud. But there are differences between the US and Europe and India, uh, obviously. But the voting technology is, uh, is vastly, vastly different. 
Um, our machines here tend to be very complex, large, expensive, computer-like systems. Um, uh, some of the machines that we've looked at um, in, uh, in my experience, in my own personal uh, research, um, have been uh, uh, essentially 486s. Uh, they've had this, or they've had the same architecture as um, uh, a Windows mobile device. Um, they run full-fledged operating systems and have all of the uh, regular software security problems. <clears throat> in India, in contrast, the machines use a very simple embedded system design, uh, special purpose, no removable storage. Um, you'll see it's very, very different from a, uh, uh, a normal PC. Um, and the question is, does this simple design um, invalidate what we've learned from studying the complex machines in the US and Europe? Is the complexity of these machines really um, essential to this pattern of vulnerability that we've been observing? Um, and our work in India shows that, in fact, these machines are also very vulnerable, um, but in different ways than the machines in the US and Europe. And this is the first major study to uh, examine the security of a deployed electronic voting system outside of the US and Europe. So, um, Talking about why the machines were designed to develop the way they were. Um, um, that figure on the slide is wrong. It's actually a larger number of votes than that. But there are 1.4 million machines um, in use in India to count these votes. It's just incredible, um, the scale once again. India faces some unique constraints, anyway, very different constraints from the ones we have in, uh, in conducting elections. Um, one, one of those constraints is the cost of the machines. With so many machines in use, uh, they couldn't afford to deploy machines that cost what uh, the voting machines used in the U.S. do. Many of our electronic voting machines cost uh, multiple thousands of dollars. Um, the machines in India were developed so that each one costs about $200. Um, another constraint is power. Uh, these machines have to be used in places that just uh, don't have any electric supply, and where there isn't electric, uh, an electric supply for miles. Sometimes votes are counted in places that don't have any electricity. Um, this is very different from the US, where uh, machines often have battery backup, but uh, that's for use occasionally uh, in the case of power failure. You don't plan to conduct your whole election without power. Uh, environmental conditions are very, very harsh in many parts of India where these machines are used. Uh, there are extremes of temperature from uh, freezing cold in the Himalayas to uh, uh, very, very hot in the tropics. I think in Hyderabad today I checked and the high is going to be 87, so it uh, sounds awfully nice from uh, my perspective in Boston now. But, um, but for uh, building systems that are going to be reliable and used year after year, um, this is a concern. Some of the documents we read mentioned uh, among the threats that they considered to their electronic voting machine were, and, and I quote, attack by vermin and fungus. Um, <laughs> these, these machines have to be stored in uh, non-climate controlled warehouses. They have to be transported for miles and miles over unpaved roads. Um, some of them have to be uh, taken in by boat into places in the jungle that are only accessible on the river and then, uh, uh, and then used, used there. So it, it's, it's an amazing challenge that they face because the, the election officials really have committed to building a voting system that can be used by everyone in India. They're not going to use different things for people in urban areas and people in rural areas, people who are educated and people who are not. It's, it's very egalitarian. Um, so even voters who are illiterate, and the literacy rate in India now is only, uh, it's about 67%, um, but uh, among women it's closer to 50%. Um, th so they need voting machines that can be used by people who are illiterate, uh, and even people who are um, technologically illiterate to a level that, that we can barely understand. People who in their daily lives um, don't use light switches. Um, whose uh, uh, village where they live does not have um, access to uh, 
uh, technology that people interact with on a daily basis. Uh, so the machines have to use the simplest possible design. And finally, there are, there's this challenge of booth capture. So this is really the one on this list that is a security challenge. And it relates to the um, overall level of security in Indian society. Um, so before the machines were introduced, they used a paper ballot system. And an all too common way of attacking this system uh, was that uh, a group of goons, uh, as, as they call them, uh, who were working for a candidate would show up at the polling place and uh, just tell everyone politely to go away. Or, um, and then they'd proceed to stuff the ballot box uh, for as, as long as they wanted or until the authorities showed up, which might be several hours later. Um, and uh, sometimes this was reported, sometimes it wasn't reported because people um, uh, believed there would be consequences to turning the goons in. Um, so uh, booth capture was a, a, a dramatic threat. Um, today, policing has gotten much better in most parts of India, um, but we don't know what would happen, how this reintroduced. So let me show you the machine and give you some ideas about uh, how it responds to these design constraints. Um, so India's machines you have consist of two units that are joined by a um, five meter cable. Um, on the left here you see the ballot unit. Um, and the, the user interface is just beautifully simple. Um, uh, when a voter arrives, uh, he just presses the button to the name of the candidate he wants to vote for, um, and uh, that arrow lights up, the machine beeps, and the voter's finished. So you can see there's several things about this that, uh, that help simplify it. First of all, there's only a single race, um, because it's, it's typically a parliamentary election, so there's just a single question on the ballot. Um, another thing is that uh, next to the name of each candidate, there's a symbol. Um, and parties can take a symbol from uh, a list of options uh, that they can include in all of their advertising. And this becomes um, a way for illiterate voters to pick uh, the candidate they want to win, uh, even if they can't read the script in which the name is written. And there's so many languages in India uh, that uh, you couldn't possibly have a ballot that included the names in every different one. Um, so this is extremely helpful. Okay, the other piece um, you can see in this, this picture is the control unit on the right. Um, and while, whereas the ballot unit is contained in um, a, a voting booth where people can't see what the voter is picking, the control unit is kept uh, in public where everyone can see it and is what the election officials use to, um, uh, to run the election. Uh, so um, the... Uh, Election official can press that big ballot button, um, and that allows a single vote. And the voter uses the control unit to cast it. Um, <clears throat> inside the ballot unit, when you open these doors, there are a lot more functions that are activated. Um, and uh, the system of doors is, is a very interesting security feature. Uh, they can be independently sealed. There are four different doors that are independently sealed. Um, and those seals are broken at different places in the election cycle. Uh, this is a security mechanism to allow different functions to be executed at different times, and it's built into the physical design of the machine. Um, the, uh, to walk you through an election cycle, um, this is important to really understanding the, uh, the way the system can be attacked. Um, <clears throat> let me show you up here. Uh, before the election begins, um, Poll workers uh, initialize the machine by pressing this candidate's button uh, to control the only parameter, which is the number of candidates on the ballot. Um, then uh, they press this clear button to zero out the number of votes, erase whatever results are left from the last election, um, and close and seal the plastic doors, all four of them. Um, then on the morning of the election, um, they come in and they can press the total button to make sure that there are, in fact, zero votes that have been cast so far. Um, and uh, uh, they can begin polling by pressing the ballot button for each vote, let the voter cast a vote. 
Um, then uh, when, the, uh, when voting is finished, when everyone's done uh, casting, they press this black close button. And that involves opening the first of the seals on the machine. Um, after the election is closed, it will accept no further votes. Um, and the machines are, are ready for counting. But then something strange happens. So uh, in India, there can be a delay between when votes are cast and when they're counted, lasting up to several weeks. Um, this is because voting sometimes happens in phases around the country, and they don't want results to be known in some places before others. So the machines are taken and put in, uh, in a warehouse in a protected room until, it's re until counting time comes. Then on counting day, um, the uh, election officials um, unseal another one of the doors, and they press this button, the result button. And uh, that causes the machine to output the number of votes that each candidate received on these LEDs at the top. Um, and they literally, they do this in front of a room full of people like this one, where there are people from the press, people from different candidates. And they hold the machine up in front of the room and press that button. And that way, everyone can read what's coming off of it. And that's how they extract the information. It's not a system like we have where maybe the machine plugs into uh, a telephone line or something and uploads the results to a central system, or where there are printouts that uh, uh, have to be preserved and protected. It's just the, the, the counting happens in a very public way. So here's the whole sequence. Uh, the machine shows the total number of votes, the number of candidates, and then for each candidate, the number of votes they've received, uh, with a couple of seconds delay in between each. So that's the Indian system. <clears throat> so the Election Commission of India, yeah? Sorry, just going back to the constraints, sure. so, so it's pretty obvious how this addresses things like cost and, and other, other constraints. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the, the booth takeover constraint? Ah, yes, yes. Is I'm sorry. I, I meant to. Is it or anything can address it? Yes. Um, so um, uh, booth capture, these, these people coming in and stuffing the ballot box um, was one of the major things that they tried to address in this design. And the way they did that was um, uh, they introduced an, uh, uh, in the software a kind of rate limiting feature. So the machine will only allow um, uh, about uh, six votes every minute. And if you try to authorize votes at a faster rate than that, it just adds a delay. Um, so that's their answer to booth capture. Um, make it so uh, uh, even if the polling place is taken over by a squad of goons, the goons can only do so much damage um, because it will take them all day um, to insert a, a, a very large number of votes. So it's interesting. But this system, I, I think it addresses, yeah. How do they make sure that the mapping between what's between the listed uh, candidates and the candidates that are not listed is the same or is consistent across all of the? Mm. That's, that's a good question. Um, this ballot paper, uh, the order of the candidates on the ballot, um, is determined um, a couple of weeks before the election and widely uh, printed in the newspapers and so forth, so that it's well known. Um, and uh, uh, presumably, some fraction of people in the place who want to vote for a particular candidate uh, will notice if that candidate is somewhere different. Um, uh, Another interesting thing is how many candidates this unit can support. So you can see there's 16 buttons. Um, so you can support up to 16 candidates on one of these ballot units. Um, but often there are more candidates than that. So they've developed a way to daisy chain these uh, ballot units together. You can have up to four of them uh, supporting up to 64 candidates. Um, and in cases where there are more than 64 candidates in a, in a single race, um, they will fall back to paper ballots. Uh, but that, that happens very, very rarely. But you can see this design is, um, in some ways, um, elegantly simple. Uh, very, very simple user interaction with the machine, um, uh, very inexpensive components, uh, and uh, uh, this allows it to be um, both easier to use for, for people and, uh, uh, and in, in many ways, more robust. Uh, than uh, large, heavy, complicated uh, computer-like voting machines that we use in the US and Europe. 
Um, so the Election Commission has been, uh, uh, has been extremely proud, I think, of this system they've developed, one of the, uh, uh, probably the largest deployment of electronic voting anywhere in the world. Um, it was a point of national pride when it was introduced. Um, but I think uh, they, they may have gotten a little bit carried away. So some of the things that they've claimed about the machines uh, uh, India uses is that they're in, infallible. These are direct quotes. Uh, perfect, tamper-proof, that they have no need for technical improvement. But of course, no technology has these properties. There's no such thing as a perfect, uh, uh, infallible, tamper-proof uh, uh, security system. And I don't think we, we know of any technology that has no need whatsoever for improvement. Um, uh, nonetheless, uh, they never um, allowed an independent security review of the machines. So this, this came, to, um, came to a head in 2009. Uh, when the, the parliamentary election had some surprising results that disagreed quite a bit with the exit polls. Uh, I think this might sound familiar to some in an American audience. Um, and some of the major political parties started raising doubts about the security of the machines. Um, uh, up to this point, there had never been any opportunity for people outside of government to inspect them uh, or to uh, uh, to study their security. Um, but, but people started raising doubts, and so the Election Commission issued a challenge to the public. They said, uh, anyone can come to our offices uh, and demonstrate tampering uh, on a real machine in front of us. And if you can demonstrate how you can tamper with it, then we'll believe you, we'll say. Of course, you were right and we're wrong. Um, so it was at this point that my co-author, Harry Prasad, became involved, and he was asked by uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, nonprofit foundations in India uh, to go to Delhi to the, the capital and to uh, try to take up this challenge. So his team arrived at the election commission um, and they started examining the machine. They, they opened it up, they started looking, they, they were scribbling down notes. And Harry, Harry, when he tells this story, says he expected, well, they might have to spend a few weeks there analyzing it before they could figure out some flaw. Um, but he says as soon as he opened it up, he, he turned to the election commission guys who were present in the room and he said, oh, I, I'm only going to need the afternoon. This is really easy. <laughs> um, so at that point, they got really nervous. And uh, after about 10 minutes of Harry and his, his fellows examining the machine, uh, they told them to stop. They halted the inspection um, uh, and told them, oh, we're going to have to talk about this some more. And uh, eventually they released an explanation that uh, they, they thought they were um, doing too much reverse engineering. They weren't allowed to actually figure out how it worked because there were government patents involved. Which is, a, of course, a, a pretty, pretty ludicrous explanation. But then they came back and modified their public challenge after this. They said, um, yes, anyone can come to our office and examine the machines and demonstrate how they can be tampered with, um, but you're only allowed to do Normal tampering. <laughs> so, where, where normal tampering means you can't open the machine. So I guess this is just what, uh, uh, what a voter, a naive voter in the voting booth could do. I'm, I'm not really sure what they mean by this, but it's just ridiculous. Has anyone heard of normal tampering before? Um, so uh, that was the situation at the end of uh, 2009. Um, uh, in 2010, uh, things changed because uh, in February, an anonymous source approached Harry Prasad and gave him access to a machine. He gave him full access to do whatever study he wanted. So this anonymous source, I, I can say a few things. Uh, Harry has protected the identity of this source extremely well and uh, has even spent time in jail to protect the identity of the source. Um, but this is a, a person who, um, it was my understanding, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, had genuine concerns about the integrity of elections and um, uh, had provided the machine uh, out of a sense of, of civic duty. Uh, I understand that the source had um, legitimate access to the machine, 
Uh, and so this is, uh, in my mind, uh, a whistleblowing situation. So the source approached Harry in February. Uh, and this was the first time anyone outside of government had ever had full access to the machine. Um, and Harry, by a, a, an amazing coincidence and uh, turn of events, was able to uh, get in touch with me and uh, Rob Honkreip from the Netherlands, who are two of the people in the world who are most experienced with taking apart deployed voting systems. And, and we were able to travel to India late in February and spend a, a good deal of time uh, uh, working with the machines. Then uh, between then and April, we all had very little sleep. Uh, a lot of long nights uh, by a video conference uh, back and forth with India. Finally, at the end of April, we released our findings and our paper on the web and on Indian TV, a YouTube video, uh, and uh, uh, we were able to tell the world about what we found very quickly. Um, so here we are. That on the, uh, on the right there, that's Rob Honkreip, and there I am and Harry in the middle. Uh, this is after several nights without any sleep in Hyderabad. Um, but you can tell uh, we, uh, we're having a good time. And that shows you the scale of these machines, though. They're not uh, tiny little things. Here's what we found when we opened them up. Um, this is the first time, when, when we published these pictures in the, uh, with our paper, it was the first time uh, voters in India actually saw what was inside the machines. And I'm not sure what the big secret is. Um, uh, it's, it's really a very simple embedded system. It's uh, uh, a microprocessor, some memory chips. These are micro switches. Um, uh, the, the main board here connects via a ribbon cable to a little subboard that displays the results. This is a speaker, and we've covered over the uh, aperture in the speaker because uh, we, were, we took these photos as we were doing tests um, at night. And the speaker is so loud, um, it, ear-splittingly loud, uh, when it beeps after each vote, um, that uh, uh, dogs all around the neighborhood would start barking every time uh, we did a, a run-through of our test. So for our own sanity and the... the uh, the welfare of the neighborhood, we covered it up. Yeah? Mm. Uh, it's not actually internal only. That's a power switch on the back. Uh, there's a, uh, a slot in the back through which those ports and switch extend. So a um, little bit of a close-up. Uh, here's the CPU. It's um, an 8-bit, 8.8 uh, megahertz microcontroller, a Renesas piece. Um, uh, it controls, the, it also contains the election software, which is stored in uh, an on-chip masked ROM. Um, here, these are two serial EEPROMs. Uh, they store the votes, and they, they, each one stores a complete copy uh, of the election outcome. Um, here's the other board, the smaller display board. Uh, the display board, um, uh, of course, uh, is where the election results appear. Uh, just six seven-segment LEDs in almost the simplest possible uh, circuitry. It's just uh, multiplexed directly driven by the CPU um, uh, through that 15-pin ribbon cable. Okay, so that's the design. Um, and it didn't take us long to think of uh, a few different ways that this might be attacked. But we didn't just want to um, hypothesize that some attack might be possible. Um, we're... Um, uh, experimental researchers, and so we wanted to try to prototype different kinds of attacks um, so we could uh, figure out how difficult they'd be in practice, whether there'd be uh, unusual problems that we didn't think of, whether they'd be practical, or how expensive they'd be. Um, it's like any other kind of systems research. Uh, you want to actually build an experiment with uh, the thing uh, you're, you're talking about. Um, and I, I think that's extremely important in security because it's just so easy to say something's broken, but to actually show and quantify how broken it is uh, takes a lot more work. So we focused on three different classes of attacks, uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, show you what we found in each case. Now, these first two kinds of vulnerabilities, um, dishonest look-alike devices and tampering with state, uh, as I'll explain, uh, they require physical access to the machines after they're out in the field. So it's a really important question, 
how difficult it is uh, for criminals to gain access to them uh, without being detected. Um, so this is how the machines are sealed. Uh, this will give you some idea of the overall state of their security. In, in keeping with the simple design philosophy, the, the physical security is provided by simple seals. Um, these are images from uh, an official training video that show how the doors on the machine are sealed literally with wax and string. Uh, this is not a high-tech security device. Uh, on the bottom of the machine, they have some tamper evidence seals over the screw holes to uh, show if you've, you've opened the screws. They consist of some inkjet printed stickers. So uh, can, can anyone in this room think of a way you might, uh, I, I don't know, tamper with these seals without getting caught? Uh, I mean, if, you, if we run down the street and buy some, uh, some uh, sticky paper, if we go get a candle, uh, these are not devices that someone who's had any time to prepare and uh, is at all a serious attacker um, will be detected with. Um, furthermore, the machine, yeah. Mm. Right, so, mm. so yeah, you're deterring the, the opportunistic attacker and you're, you're hopefully uh, convincing the, uh, uh, a thief to find an easier target. Um, so maybe these seals will help convince um, uh, election uh, fraudsters that they should go pick on some other country that, uh, that doesn't bother to put paper stickers over uh, the screws on their machines. I don't know. Um, uh, um, so the machines are kept in warehouses um, at various parts of the election cycle that are, are supposed to be protected, um, but the security varies widely here too. Some of them might actually be strong, but others are um, uh, basically abandoned industrial warehouses or um, old high school gymnasiums, uh, that sort of thing. It sounds a little bit like where voting machines are stored before elections some places in the U.S. Um, but uh, um, each of these warehouses, we've, we've, we've done the math, and each, each has to contain, uh, on, on average, a couple of thousand machines. So you can imagine, if you're a criminal, um, you need to break your way into or bribe your way into um, only a small number of warehouses uh, in uh, uh, parliamentary districts that are hotly contested uh, in order to shift enough votes to change an outcome in a, in a national election. Uh, th this highly concentrated way of storing them makes the, the risk huge. Um, so uh, our first attack based on uh, physical access to the machines involves dishonest look-alike devices. So, uh, Harry investigated this idea before I even got on the scene. And uh, the thought is um, you could just build an identical looking voting machine uh, that, that looked and acted the same way as the real ones, but at the end of the election would output dishonest results. And if you could swap some of these in, you'd be done. So Harry, Harry built a prototype of uh, one of these dishonest look-alike EVMs in uh, uh, just a, a couple of weeks costing um, uh, a little bit less than the real one. And, <laughs> and the, the difficult thing, the only difficult thing at all, was trying to make a realistic case that looked like the real one. So plastic injection molding turns out to be uh, more difficult uh, for, for, uh, for most engineers to do anyway than uh, manufacturing PC boards and uh, uh, designing circuits. Um, so that, that was an, an interesting finding. Um, but when I, when I got there, I thought, um, uh, I looked at this machine and tried to think of a simpler way that we could um, replace some of it anyway with dishonest uh, look-alike components and change results. And in fact, every piece of the unit is essentially is trusted, every major component, the, the ballot unit itself as a unit, the control unit as a unit, even the cable connecting them. If any of these pieces is replaced by a dishonest look-alike, it could uh, change the outcome. Um, but when I looked at it, I, I thought, um, uh, oh, I should, I should tell this whole story. So uh, I, I was going to India. I was invited to India for um, uh, a pair of symposia that were being held uh, about electronic voting security. 
Um, and uh, I, I'd been interested in their voting machines for years, so I, I, I decided right away I would go. But uh, a couple of days before my flight was going to take off, I think actually it was Thursday and my flight was on Monday night, um, uh, I got a phone call that, oh, oh, we have something else to tell you. Uh, our, our friend uh, Harry Prasad has a machine. And whoa, you have one of these machines? This is going to be a much more exciting trip than I thought. And it was then that I saw the, the first really primitive cell phone pictures of the inside. Um, and uh, uh, at, that, um, at that point, in that conversation, uh, I thought, what device can we build to demonstrate this attack next week? <coughs> and this is the, play, the piece that I decided um, was feasible to attack, the display board. Could we make a dishonest look-alike display board that would change election results? So I went downstairs to teach my grad level security class. Um, and uh, at the beginning of the, the lecture, I, I asked the group, um, does anyone here know how to make a circuit board? Because I'm, a, I'm, not, a, I'm not a hardware guy by training. And w one of the students who was, uh, uh, one, one of the students was foolish enough to raise his hand and meekly volunteer. And he spent, uh, uh, I think, most of the time in, uh, with, between then and when my flight left on Monday. Uh, designing and having manufactured and then assembling uh, our first prototype of this attack. And uh, that student, Eric Wustrow, is now one of my grad students. Um, so here's what we built. Uh, this is the final version of this attack. He built in those few days the prototype version, um, which, which worked. Uh, but our final version of the attack is a bit more complicated. Um, so it looks just like the real display board, except underneath these components, we've hidden some extra circuitry. So uh, here on the left uh, is uh, a microcontroller that essentially does a man in the middle attack on what the uh, CPU is trying to display on the LEDs. Uh, it interprets the uh, output as the machine is displaying it and then calculates a different outcome with different votes for the candidates that, that shifts a fraction of the vote to, uh, uh, a, preferred, uh, to a preferred candidate. Uh, so stealing uh, uh, proportionally from everyone else. This is a little bit challenging because we don't know the full results before we have to commit to the first one. We have to, every t each can the candidates are shown in sequence, so when candidate number one's total is displayed, we have to steal uh, some fraction, but not too much, uh, or, uh, uh, and not too little. Um, so there's some interesting heuristics that we, we use to, uh, 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 to do that. Um, here, uh, this is another component that uh, 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 you'll see in, oh, I should show you these first. So here you see the machine, uh, the actual machine with our display board, and the real one. Uh, uh, here on the real board, you see that the um, LEDs are raised above the PC board by this plastic spacer. And this was convenient for us because it actually gave us enough room to hide our components and still be realistic. So, uh, from physical examination, uh, uh, for a, a non-technical person, it would be impossible to tell the difference. For a technical person, they might notice that the traces are slightly different, uh, but we could handle that with further engineering and a multi-layer board. Um, so the one complication here um, uh, is who is going to be this preferred candidate? How do you tell the board which candidate should receive the stolen votes? Because ideally, you're going to take over a warehouse once, spend one night in the warehouse, replace these boards on all the machines, and then you want to be able to cheat in election after election after that for the life of the machines but you won't know years in advance who, where your candidate will be on the ballot. Um, so you need some mechanism to signal to the machine who, you're, who the winner should be. And we um, investigated several different methods for this. There are interesting things you can do with kind of sending secret knocks in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the outcome uh, or during the uh, setup of the machines. Uh, there's a very interesting system that involves actually using the number of 
votes on the, the number of candidates on the ballot as a signal to all of the machines in the district. Um, but I, I don't want to go into those. Instead, I'll show you what we prototyped. Um, so this other chip here, uh, that's actually a Bluetooth radio module. It's about the size of my thumbnail. Um, and that Bluetooth radio module receives a signal uh, from a mobile phone uh, running software we programmed uh, that allows you to select who's going to win and by what fraction. Uh, so either during, the, during voting or during the count, uh, criminals could use a radio signaling mechanism like this to signal to uh, the machines uh, how they should cheat. All right, so that's the first attack. So uh, that's all. So these first attacks about tampering with the uh, replacing the machines with lookalikes. These are ways that um, before voting happens, you can uh, alter the machines to actually uh, change them in ways that let you you cheat uh, for a long period of time. And that that's one class. Another kind of class of attacks involves um, making the machine um, not not replacing parts of the machine, but just changing its um, uh, the, the storage inside it. So you can think this, this machine is kind of like a ballot box in the sense that it's responsible for maintaining the integrity of this record of the election um, from the time po uh, polling begins until the time the votes are publicly announced uh, during counting. And so if you can tamper with what's inside it, you can change, uh, uh, you can change the results. So we looked at how easy or difficult would it be um, to tamper with what these EEPROM memory chips are storing? So assuming you had some physical access to the machines, um, how much does the technology do uh, to store that state? Um, so uh, Harry and his team in Hyderabad reverse engineered the storage mechanism inside these chips. And they uh, hooked them up uh, to a laptop. and uh, reverse engineered the format. It, it turns out it's really, really simple. So first, the electrical interface is I squared C, so something that you can speak to from uh, uh, very easily with commodity components. Um, and then the software format uh, has no cryptographic protection whatsoever. Uh, it just stores a one byte record for each vote that maps the button that was pressed. So these are also stored in order. So you have this array of bytes that is the sequence of votes that were cast. So this has some really terrible security properties. Um, storing the votes in order means that if you can download the contents of the memory chips, um, you can go and compare the order of votes, uh, of, uh, the order of candidate selections to the order in which people use the machine, and then find out how everyone voted. And uh, the order of, uh, in which people use the machine, this is really easy to determine by just watching the polling place or videotaping who goes in and out. Or actually, um, people sign a register, and it's a matter of public record, uh, the order in which people voted. Um, so uh, the ballot is not quite secret uh, from the technology. Um, but changing the votes is a threat here, too. So, uh, if you hooked up a computer setup like this to the machine, you could just rewrite the contents of that, that memory chip and uh, have different candidates uh, in, uh, change the bytes in that array to have different candidates. Now, this doesn't look very practical, though. So 1.4 million machines in the country say, at, at a minimum, you're going to have to change votes in uh, some number of thousands of machines in order to have a, an effect in, in practice in, in a typical national election. Uh, with a fairly close margin. So th this looks really cumbersome. It's going to take a very long time. So we thought, how could we make this into a more practical attack? And I set my students out to build this device, which I call Clippy. And Clippy is our miniaturized form of this vote stealing attack. So Clippy clips directly to the memory chips inside the machine um, and rewrites them. Uh, to steal votes by proportionally shifting them in favor of a preferred candidate. Uh, it takes uh, maybe um, about a second from when you attach it to uh, 
uh, when it's finished. You just leave the, open the machine's case and leave it powered on and attach it directly. And uh, it does the rest. Uh, I think this orange LED lights up while it's working and then the green one comes on when it's done. So the knob on top of Clippy uh, lets you select which candidate is going to receive the votes. Uh, so you can pick here you see candidate two is going to uh, be the beneficiary of the, the vote stealing. Yeah? You do have, to, yes, yes. Well, so it depends on, uh, it depends on how well prepared you are. Um, but uh, uh, we estimate that it'll take uh, maybe a minute or two minutes per machine. And if you have multiple guys, one of them can be responsible for doing this, another one for redoing the wax seal, uh, another one for reapplying the inkjet seals and so forth. Um, so what this shows uh, is that, um, uh, th is that the tampering with state attack um, could be used to conduct an electronic form of the booth capture attack that uh, they worried about with paper ballots. Um, so this device is simple enough to use and inexpensive enough um, that if you were a dishonest candidate, you could distribute them to your squad of goons uh, and have them go out into the field and do this. Rewriting the state like this allows you to completely bypass the machine's rate limiting functions because the software is no longer in control of uh, the, uh, the votes that have been recorded. Um, and so uh, 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 criminal outsiders could theoretically use this to do something um, very similar to booth capture. Yeah? It looks like the machine has an upper limit of four digits for the number of votes per candidate. Yes. Mm. Um, per machine, that's right. Um, uh, and it would be suspicious if you did that many, of course. But still, you could, um, uh, uh, you could, move, you could insert thousands of votes per machine. Um, so criminal outsiders is one threat. In all these cases, we also worry very much about dishonest insiders. Um, and historically, uh, in almost every voting system, uh, threats from insiders have been the biggest worry. Uh, who, who's watching the, who is watching the people who are entrusted to, uh, to conduct the election fairly? Um, which brings us to the last problem, uh, the last class of attacks that we worried about, uh, which have to do with the software that counts the votes. Um, and uh, this software, uh, these attacks we weren't able to actually um, uh, actually prototype or experiment with, and you'll see why in, in a second. So the, the electronic voting machines in India has lack transparency and verifiability, which are um, uh, two essential properties for secure electronic voting that we've outlined in the research literature. Transparency means essentially that voters or their delicate delegates can watch the process and know that the outcome was fair. Uh, verifiability means voters have a way to, uh, to check that their votes were counted correctly. And the machines fail um, dramatically in both regards. So in terms of transparency, um, uh, the source code to the machines isn't, uh, uh, th which has complete access and complete ability to control the outcome um, is something that the election commission doesn't even own. It's owned by these companies that make the machines. Um, furthermore, they've never even seen the code. Uh, I, I was shocked to learn this from their, uh, the, the head of their, their technical committee, uh, this professor P. V. and um, that uh, they, they, they've never even been able to analyze it themselves. But furthermore, they say that only three or four guys, quote unquote, know what's in the code. Uh, and these are mid-level engineers at the government companies that make the machines. Um, all right, so the voting system is so secret that the only people who actually know what's going on in the process of counting are these three or four guys. Now the election commission, they've assured me that these three or four guys, they, they, they've met them, they've met them and they think they're pretty trustworthy. <coughs> um, okay, uh, 
I had a hard time believing this the first time I heard this, but I verified it with other people at the Election Commission. Um, okay, maybe these three or four guys really are honest. Uh, surely they understand that, um, uh, that if they wanted to, they could alter the outcome of national elections, but possibly they are so honest and so superhuman that they can't be bribed or threatened or coerced uh, into doing something nefarious. Um, uh, I'm willing to believe that, uh, but, but I don't think every voter should be required to believe that and to trust the machines and these three or four guys in order to have confidence in the elections. It just doesn't seem normatively like how democracy is supposed to function. Um, furthermore, though, uh, if these guys are dishonest, they can get changes into the software that will be very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to detect. Um, because the firmware is burned into the chips uh, in a way that is extremely difficult to read back out. Uh, this was a deliberate feature in the design, I think because they wanted to protect their intellectual property, um, uh, that the code would be, uh, would be uh, nearly impossible to, to verify and to make sure that it's actually the code that's supposed to be in there. Um, so even the election commission has no way to check that the code that's actually in the chips in the machines matches the source code that they haven't seen. So even if they had seen it, they couldn't check. We worry, too, um, that the chips are burned and fabricated outside of India. Um, now, as a matter of national sovereignty, a country might want to, uh, uh, to have confidence that its election system couldn't be tampered with by, by foreign governments. Um, but in fact, since the chips and all of their impossible to inspect software are produced outside of India and then couriered in, uh, they ought to worry that um, foreign intelligence agencies and so forth um, would have an opportunity to change the chips on their way in, uh, either by replacing the software or uh, replacing the whole chips with dishonest lookalikes. Um, so voters have no choice but to trust the voting machines. There's uh, no record other than the electronic one. Uh, there is uh, no way to verify uh, even whether the software inside is, is what is alleged to be the correct software. Um, so voters have no choice but to trust the systems. So our study ended up uh, concluding several things um, based on these findings, that the machines are far from being perfect and infallible. Um, actually, they're insecure and they're vulnerable to attack either by uh, dishonest insiders uh, or by criminals with physical access to the machines. Um, and attacking these things doesn't take um, a lot of high technology. It's not an expensive high tech operation. You don't need to do fancy software reverse engineering necessarily. Um, it just takes basic electronic skills. Um, our dishonest display board and our uh, Clippy manipulator device, each of these cost um, just a few dollars to build in quantity. They were things that grad students could make uh, in days or weeks. Um, so in India, we estimate that there are at least a million people with the necessary training and skills to execute attacks like this. Um, uh, and once done, these attacks might be very, very difficult to actually detect, um, especially manipulating the state of the machines, because that could leave no physical evidence in terms of parts that have been changed. Uh, this creates a situation where um, uh, I think voters are, would be right to worry about the integrity of election results. Although we want to be very careful to emphasize that our study does not show that any past election has been tampered with or stolen, uh, and we did not uh, even attempt uh, such an analysis that's outside the scope. Um, none of us want to be killed. <laughs> So the reactions in India. Hmm. So um, when we initially released our findings, um, the, uh, the reaction in the media was, uh, was, was quite strong. People um, in many of the papers and TV channels covered the result. Uh, the results we found, um, Harry actually did a live demonstration on television with the actual machine where he used the dishonest display um, to change the results. But um, uh, 
Uh, the election commission responded by basically just denying it all, saying, oh, uh, they didn't even have one of our machines. None of this is true. Um, and that, that uh, cut down on the, uh, the reaction for a while, but Harry kept talking to the press, and uh, uh, the um, debate about this uh, was sort of simmering in India uh, over uh, a period of a few months. Um, Eventually, the Election Commission admitted that the machine was real, um, uh, and in fact uh, said it had been stolen uh, uh, from one of their warehouses. Um, but they maintained that despite what we had demonstrated, the machines were still practically tamper-proof, uh, whatever that means. Um, but behind the scenes, they were very unhappy. They started, the Election Commission launched a police investigation um, uh, into the stolen, the stolen machine. Um, and uh, were making uh, increasing, um, uh, increasingly critical and dramatic threats against Harry uh, for his participation in the study. So then, um, I guess we don't have sound in here. Um, uh, then, in late August, uh, uh, something dramatic happened to Harry. Uh, the police showed up at his house. Uh, uh, late in the, uh, early in the morning on August 21st. Um, 10 or 15 police officers, he says now, uh, barged into his apartment, woke up his parents and his wife and his kids, um, uh, and uh, told him, um, you have to come with us, you're under arrest, uh, uh, unless you want to tell us the identity of your anonymous source, uh, in which case everything will go away. So um, I actually, uh, the, so the police took Harry from his home in Hyderabad uh, to Mumbai where this particular police station was and where the machine in question had come from. Uh, this was a, a 14 hour drive uh, over land. Um, uh, interestingly, the, the cops decided to uh, let Harry keep his cell phone. Um, so he started making calls to all of his, his friends, other activists involved in this, the press, uh, uh, I, I learned uh, when I woke up the next morning that uh, he had been taken uh, and reached him while he was still in the police car. Uh, and I actually made this recording with him in the police car. Let's see if I can get it to play. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, hold on. Let's see. Okay, I'm okay, thanks. I'm okay. I, we just reached uh, Mumbai. In another 20 25 minutes, we'll be reaching the police station. Uh, uh, police came to my house at 5 30 in the morning, saying that uh, they're going to take me into custody as uh, I couldn't revert back to them on the uh, anonymity. In a sense, like I, I didn't disclose who has. Uh, given me the mission. They said like if you want to get out of this, you have to find who has given you and you get out of this issue, then nobody will touch you. The police police are getting pressure on the top, so obviously they can't do anything. They have no other option than arresting me. The only thing what I want to say is this kind of intimidation will hit the hearts of volunteers and no volunteer will come forward if this kind of thing happens in future. That's the reason I'm going to take it on and I'll face it so that the volunteers get inspired by me. And I, the ultimate goal is we have to achieve that these machines are not fit enough for the elections. This is what I'm thinking and I want to say whatever research we have done or whatever work we have done is right with all my heart. Thanks for your concern. So that's my, my co-author on his way to jail. Um, not something that I expected to, uh, uh, to face when I em embarked on this. Um, but Harry did take it on, um, and he uh, stuck to his promise to protect the name of the source. 
the police kept him in, in jail by basically by himself for uh, an entire week without any charge and uh, without any opportunity to, uh, to go before a judge. Um, and they spent every day questioning him about where he had gotten the machine. Um, Indi in India, you, you don't have um, uh, uh, any kind of right not to uh, incriminate yourself and to, uh, to preserve or protect uh, uh, identities like this. So um, the, the best, in fact, you, you have to answer the police's questions uh, or, uh, or it's a crime. So Harry, um, uh, his line was, uh, I don't remember when they asked him who the, who the source was. I don't remember. And uh, in, in India, he tells me, um, people um, find this credible. It's, it's a country where they, they still believe very much in, in mysticism in many ways. And so people in, and in, uh, 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 in, in, in yoga and mysticism and so forth. And so people are willing to believe that you could, you could will yourself to forget something like this. Um, uh, and, and so that was his story. But the police kept on it. Um, uh, he has some great stories about this that uh, uh, at one point they said, well, if, if you don't remember the name, at least you, you must remember the face. Uh, and so they brought in a sketch artist who spent most of the day uh, working with Harry and constructing this, this, this portrait um, of, uh, of the source. And so the, uh, uh, when, when the sketch artist was finished, the, the uh, the cops gathered around, including the, the chief police inspectors and so forth, and some big guys who had come in from, from Delhi who were with the intelligence service, and they gathered around, and they, they revealed the picture. Uh, and it was the, a picture of the top cop at the police station. <laughs> um, and Harry said, well, gosh, you, but you've, been, uh, you've been beating on me and asking me questions for, for days and days. All I can think of is your face. <laughs> So they, they really, they didn't get, get anything out of him. And in fact, they became pretty good friends after, uh, <laughs> uh, after all of it. I think the police were very sympathetic. Um, but after, after eight days with the cops, um, Harry was finally brought before a magistrate who, uh, uh, who heard uh, the story. And he had actually seen our results and seen our paper on the website. And, and the judge's reaction was, um, uh, uh, was to immediately order that Harry be released on bail. And he, he went beyond that. It's very rare to have, have this kind of dicta in an Indian bail hearing, but the, the judge added that what Harry Prasad had done uh, was a service to his country. And if there's a question about whether the results of the study uh, are right, then that deserves to be investigated separately. But whether this man had any criminal intent whatsoever uh, in possessing this machine um, is, is beyond question. So um, after that, uh, Harry was free on bail, but they continued the investigation. And in fact, despite the bail order, uh, the police um, held Harry in Mumbai for the next month um, by issuing him a summons every day to report to the police station. Uh, so at 10 o'clock every morning, he had to go to the police station, and uh, some days they'd ask a couple of questions. Other days, they'd just have him sit around for most of the day. But there was no way he could return to his family or his business that were 14 hours away. Um, so um, uh, the inquiry went on from that point, but, uh, 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 but let me tell you what was happening simultaneously outside of jail. So while Harry was sitting there unable to communicate with us, um, uh, I and uh, his other friends uh, in, in India uh, started blogging about this and telling people uh, and explaining what had happened. And it became uh, one of the biggest stories in the Indian media. It became something that was widely talked about in international blogs. Um, the issue took on uh, an immense uh, amount of interest, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, especially throughout India. Um, this caused people to really step back a bit and question why the government was doing this to Harry. Uh, uh, people, I, I believe, um, saw that the, uh, the accusations that the machine had been stolen were um, uh, irrelevant to the question of whether the, uh, the study was correct and whether they were in fact perfect and tamper-proof or insecure and vulnerable. 
Um, and people, um, eventually, uh, there was a growing consensus uh, that the machines needed to go, that the study, uh, the results of the study showed that they were not sufficient um, uh, for India's elections. Eventually, the election commission was forced to hold a public meeting with the political parties, uh, all of the major national parties. And um, in October, they had this meeting to discuss what to do about the machines. And um, at uh, a, a, near, a nearly unanimous uh, request from the political parties um, forced the election commission um, uh, to commit to uh, to changing the system. And in fact, the election commission um, formed a subcommission uh, to study ways to achieve transparency and verifiability. That commission now, uh, which consists of technical experts from India, uh, is currently examining uh, different systems that add paper in one way or another to the existing machines. Um, so here we go, here, here we've gone in the course from February uh, to October, the, the span of my involvement here, from uh, no one ha having ever had the chance to do a, 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 a complete and independent security analysis of these machines um, to a national political consensus that they be replaced. Uh, this is just an amazing, uh, amazingly fast rate of development for something like this. In the US, uh, researchers have been talking about how paperless electronic voting is insecure. Um, for most of the last decade. And we still have many states that still use it. Uh, I think there are some advantages to having a centralized election administration. Um, so to continue the, the story, the human story behind this, um, uh, Harry was out of jail by the time that this, uh, uh, na that this national political meeting happened. But uh, he was, the, the charges against him were still pending. Uh, and uh, uh, he had been charged um, at this point with the theft of the machine, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the machine was held in one of the highest security uh, uh, repositories in the country. And uh, this man from a place uh, 14 hours away uh, isn't going to uh, go to the, the strongest place that they're stored uh, and, uh, and, and break into a government warehouse and take one. Um, but the, the charges were clearly politically motivated, and anyone in India who, who's looked at it will tell you that. Um, luckily, Harry was being defended pro bono by uh, the best criminal defense attorney in the country, uh, a man whose, uh, whose, whose father, also a famous criminal defense attorney, had defended Indira Gandhi's assassins, um, who I guess hanged for it, but uh, <laughs> but Harry <laughs> but Harry faced these charges, and the judge kept pushing back the ruling um, because uh, uh, always on on a different excuse. Oh, um, uh, uh, he wants to hear more evidence about this or that, or uh, 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 he doesn't have time. He needs a full two hours to read the the, the judgment, and we only have an hour and a half today. Oh, I want Harry to be present in person. Uh, we're going to uh, move in this defendant and merge the case with this and that. So it, it dragged out. And actually, uh, the final decision in Harry's bail argument um, came out last week. So last week, the judge finally ruled that uh, Harry Prasad uh, can go free on bail. And the charges against him uh, seem incredibly weak. And the police have no reason to question him further. Um, so to, uh, more than, uh, uh, more than uh, four months, five months almost after his arrest, uh, the, uh, 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 the charges come out. Uh, the, char the, um, the bail question is decided. Now the case, this case of the theft of the machine is pending still, um, but it seems very unlikely that, uh, that Harry will be in further jeopardy. Um, I should add that for all of this, for going to jail to defend the source uh, and his work defending the EVMs, Harry uh, was named uh, a winner of the EFF Pioneer Award uh, this year uh, and came to the US to accept it and was extremely grateful. Now, I went back to India myself last month in, in the middle of December. Rob and I went back to um, uh, 
to hold a tutorial at a security conference there. We want to work with uh, Indian voting researchers to educate them about sort of the state of the art in voting research and try to come up with solutions that work within the Indian context. Now that was our intent, but when I got to, uh, when I, I, I went to India after, uh, I guess, uh, about a 14 hour flight and got there, um, uh, I got to immigration and handed my passport to the agent. And uh, he was very friendly until he scanned it into, my com into the computer, at which point all the blood drained out of his face and he said, I'm sorry, sir, but I can't let you into India. Please wait here. Now this is sort of everyone's nightmare when you're in the immigration line, right? That there's going to be some reason why they're going to tell you you can't come in. Um, after my last visit and what had happened since, I was kind of expecting something like this, but when it actually happened, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, still a bit of a shock. Um, they held me there for, for a few minutes and may asked a few simple questions uh, right there while I was basically in the, in the middle of the immigration hall. Um, uh, but they, they clearly didn't know what the reason was why the computer said I couldn't come in. They asked, well, did, did something go wrong on your last trip? No, I, I had a great time. <laughs> so um, uh, after about an hour of, of keeping me there and uh, they, they were making some phone calls, uh, uh, they announced to me that, in fact, I was being denied entry and they were issuing an order to the airline to remove me from the country on the same plane when it returned to the U.S. Um, it was about, it was going to depart in about 45 minutes, so they were here to pick me up and the airline was going to take me there and the airline was going to be fined several thousand dollars for bringing me in without a valid visa. Now, of course, I had a valid visa. They had given it to me the week before. So, um, so I, I'm trying to think what to do. I, I call Harry. I call my other friends in India, and they say, all right, this is, this is terrible. We think we can, we can wake up people in government and try to get this fixed, but you have to not get on that flight back to the U.S. After you leave the country, there won't be any pressure anymore to solve this problem. So luckily, I like missing flights and have a lot of experience with it. Uh, and this was one flight I really, really wanted to miss. Uh, so they're hauling me back uh, to the plane. Um, and I do everything I can to delay. Uh, uh, they're, they're taking me through security lines. You have to go through three rounds of security to get on a plane leaving India for the US. And, and in each of these, I'm in line. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking on my cell phone. And, uh, if, I, if I get another call or something urgent comes on, I sort of ah, la la and, and walk out of line and all these people go ahead of me in the security queue. Um, uh, uh, if there are any, uh, any older people, anyone over about 50 comes in line behind me, I say, oh, you must go ahead of me. Oh, I couldn't possibly be so rude as to go ahead uh, of an elder. Um, uh, and uh, during this time, I'm getting phone calls from, from the American embassy, from, from the press in India. It's becoming a big story. So I have a lot of uh, uh, sort of emotional energy driving me to keep going. Um, they give me a boarding pass to hold, which I, of, of course, immediately lose. Um, <laughs> they give me another one, which I sort of immediately lose, tear up and so forth. I lose my passport in my bags, and they have to uh, uh, completely disassemble my bags to find my passport, and it, I, I lose it again, and they have to x-ray everything to find it. Uh, I can't get my shoes back on each time. I'm fumbling uh, uh, to put them on. And finally, the last round of, of security, they ask you some security questions. Did you, did you pack your bags yourself? Um, uh, did anyone give you anything to carry? Uh, <laughs> Why, why, no, I don't think I've ever seen this luggage before today, but, <laughs> but I, I, did, I did accept some, uh, some, some strange package from someone that's, that's somewhere deep in my bag. I think he might have been from Pakistan, and it sounded like it was ticking. <laughs> so they gave me the most thorough security examination I've ever seen. They, they literally ripped my bags uh, apart, took everything out. And each time after we meticulously reassembled my, my, my very uh, densely packed luggage, I'd point out that there was some compartment way at the bottom that they had forgotten to examine and they had to do it again. So at this point, the flight's almost an hour late departing, um, but they've held it for me. Thank you, Continental. Um, 
and we're, we're just, we have a, a couple of hundred feet between me and the plane. And there's not much I can do at this point except just sit on the ground and, and refuse to go and hope that they don't uh, bring the guys with guns to shoot me. But uh, two, two very nice Continental people start basically picking me up and carrying me <laughs> to the plane at this point. Um, at the very last second, a few feet from the gate, the guys from immigration appear out of nowhere and announce that, oh, we've gotten a phone call. You can stay for the night and go tomorrow. Um, thank you. <laughs> oh my god, I couldn't take any more suspense like that. This was apparently, uh, uh, one of the Continental guys told me uh, he, he's been working there for, for three years and on, only once before has someone who had been issued a deportation order uh, 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 not forced to leave that night and uh, that uh, 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 this, this absolutely never ever happened. Uh, and they deport, uh, they deport several people a day, usually about one per flight, has to go home for one reason or another given the bureaucracy. Anyway, they kept me for the next 16 hours in the airport as they tried to figure out what to do. And they were very nice to me. They let me uh, stay in the immigration chief's office uh, on his, his nice leather couch. I found a way to, to get internet access uh, and to talk to people. Meanwhile, uh, behind the scenes, uh, uh, my friends were getting quite a few people in government involved. The, Home Minister, the Foreign Minister, the Joint Minister were all woken up. The Chief Election Commissioner became involved, who was actually quite friendly with Harry at this point. Uh, the Supreme, there was a Supreme Court case ready to be filed the next morning. The Prime Minister was going to be uh, involved when he woke up the next morning. He was in Germany. Um, almost every branch of Indian government uh, was, uh, was on the case. Um, finally, the decision was made. Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Finally, the decision was made that they'd let me into the country. Um, uh, uh, it turned out the problem was I was on an intelligence blacklist. Um, but uh, with enough high-level bureaucrats involved, they let me in. And I left the airport the next day, uh, actually, uh, uh, to headlines in some of the papers saying I had been deported because they had talked to me as I was being dragged to the plane. <laughs> so uh, we weren't able to give the tutorial. Um, but, uh, 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 but we were able to um, bring a lot more attention within government to the issue and to meet with the election commission and have a, a very serious discussion with them about the, the possibilities for reform. So they can do a lot better. We do better here in some places. Um, but the, the, the problem of no transparency is, is best solved today, I think, by adding a paper trail. And you can do that either by counting paper ballots using a computer or by having a computer uh, uh, ballots that are put into a ballot box, paper records. Um, all of these systems involve having paper and electronic records combined so that it's much harder to attack than either system by itself. Um, so what now? Um, in the immediate future, India is implementing stopgap solutions that will make the specific attacks we mentioned harder. Uh, things like um, uh, putting uh, epoxy over the memory chips. So you can't clip a device directly to them. You have to clip it to the processor side of those lines instead. Um, uh, things like doing better sealing, doing more inspection, and so forth. Um, but redesign, new systems, adding paper, that's what the future has to be because the, these machines um, do not provide a level of rational confidence that, that voters in India, like voters everywhere else, deserve. Unfortunately, um, uh, the problem of uh, insecure electronic voting is spreading. So maybe you might think that India's um, bureaucracy, India's government, is trustworthy enough to get this right. Um, but increasingly, other countries are adopting it, places uh, like all of these countries on this list. Um, are uh, considering or have adopted a similar form of electronic voting. And I really worry that it could be used to prop up regimes that don't deserve uh, the support of voters. So e-voting, in summary, deserves much more attention. Almost all the attention in research has been in the US and Europe. But most of the world's democracies are not in the US and Europe. And voting there is a problem with different constraints that deserves far more uh, of our research effort. So thank you.